Welcome on board the Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, Hafsa Kara Mustafa, standing in for George Galloway. And still me, Gayatri. Five years ago this month, NATO's Operation Unified Protector started in Libya. The aim, we were told, was to avert an imminent massacre in Benghazi by stopping Gaddafi's air force from flying above the rebel city. As it turned out, the aim was standard regime change, and after the brutal lynching of the Libyan leader, the oil-rich North African nation started its long and predictable descent into chaos and lawlessness. Today, the country is a failed state and has become a base for the terror network, ISIS. To discuss this in more detail and attempt to make sense of what has become a nonsensical situation is one of my favorite political analysts, author of Divide and Ruin and journalist Dan Glazebrook. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Dan, um, you know, we were told initially that it was just a no-fly zone, that we were about to save Libya from imminent massacre. You know, what happened? Just talk us through the, the origins, really, of the NATO intervention. The UN uh, resolution was actually implemented within about two or three days. The capacity of uh, Gaddafi's air force to fly over Benghazi had been destroyed. And from that moment on, the invasion was illegal, was not uh, justified by the UN invasion and the UN mandate of, of protecting civilians, and actually became a war against uh, the Libyan state and the destruction of the state institutions. So. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. And Russia and China noted this. They noted this is not what we signed up to. The African nations who'd, who'd acquiesced in that motion explicitly said this is not what we signed up to. Uh, but the goal very quickly and obviously became regime change. And it's, it's interesting now. Over the past year, we've had a number of admissions that actually the, the goal was regime change from the start. Clinton admitted this before a congressional committee last year, Hillary Clinton. Um, and Robert Gates very um, openly and frankly said, yes, we've maintained a facade, he said, of uh, that this wasn't about regime change, but obviously it was. So they've admitted now openly that this was about uh, regime change. Although regime change itself as a euphemism. Actually, what was going on was the destruction of the Libyan state and its institutions. And um, as you said, Gayatri, the, the, the predictable result of that was the chaos and lawlessness that we now see. But they therefore deceited, deliberately deceited Russia, China, and the other African states. How did they get away with that? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Um, I mean, what is, it's interesting. Actually, there was an article in, I think it was the um, New York uh, Review of Books, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that was looking in, in detail at the, um, the African Union's intervention and role in actually creating the UN uh, resolution in 1973. The African Union representatives insisted on actually uh, uh, articles one and two of this resolution being that all attempts would be first made to create a ceasefire in the country before any military activity took place. And the African Union uh, delegation actually worked hard to, to uh, implement a ceasefire, to get both sides to agree to a ceasefire. And the Gaddafi government actually agreed um, to the ceasefire proposal put forward by the African Union. And we can see the commitment of the West to the resolution they signed up to by the fact that none of them take, took it seriously. None of them were interested in this. They were only interested in prolonging and continuing the war to, to, to the conclusion that we now see. And Jacob Zuma had to fly back actually to Johannesburg because his plane was almost attacked when the bombing raid started. Yeah. It's, it's a clear indication really that there was no intention to see a peaceful resolution to this the burgeoning conflict at the time. Yeah, that's right. And, and one of the reasons his plane was attacked was uh, because of the racism that was a, a major... Uh, a major motivation of a lot of the rebel forces in Libya. Um, th th this was completely downplayed and overlooked uh, in the West. And when it did start to come out that actually these rebel mobs supported by NATO were massacring African migrants and so on, it was justified by Western politicians on the grounds, the spurious grounds, that all of these African migrants who were being attacked and lynched and cut up and so on were all uh, mercenaries for, for Gaddafi. Amnesty International actually looked into this and they said they couldn't find any evidence of any mercenaries. In fact, what was happening was that racist lynch mobs were going around massacring African migrants um, and, and, and then 
claiming, oh, these are mercenaries for Gaddafi. So a big part of the, the motivation was, was racist. People, uh, the rebels objected to the fact that uh, Libya had put, uh, put Lib Lib Libya into a leading position within the African Union. They thought he was wasting resources on promoting African development across the continent. Um, he'd created an African Development Bank, or the African Union had created an African mm. develop uh, Development Bank that Libya had contributed significant amounts of money to, tens of billions of dollars to, as well as an African monetary fund. And all of these institutions were designed to free uh, Africa from dependence on the extortionate Western financial institutions. Um, but the, a lot of the Libyan rebels saw this as, as, as wasting Libya's money and so on. They didn't like the fact that Libyan immigrants were given good conditions mm -hmm. and jobs and so on in, in Libya. And this racism uh, was a very clear part of the rebellion that NATO uh, signed up to uh, from the very beginning. And actually, Tawaga, the only uh, black uh, North African uh, city, in my understanding, was completely ethnically cleansed um, by the rebels with the full support of the NATO-imposed transitional government. There was a, a report by the UN looking into the humanitarian impact of, uh, uh, of well, the humanitarian situation in, in Libya right now, which is obviously the result of the fallout of uh, what happened in 2011. Um, and it, it shows the devastating impact um, that, that, that that war has had. The, Libya, don't forget, in 2011, before this war, uh, was uh, ranked highest in the U UN Human Development Index in Africa. Um, it had the highest life expectancy on the continent, it had the lowest infant mortality, and so on. Um, now that situation has been completely reversed. Now I think it said 2.44 million people are dependent on uh, on aid. 1.3 million are malnourished, lacking sufficient food. And perhaps most devastatingly, for a country of only 6 million people, 1.8 million Libyans have fled the country to Tunisia. So I understand that the Libyan Investment Authority under Gaddafi, they put quite some money in prime locations and estates all over the world, including London. And they even own 3% of the Financial Times when it was still owned by Pearson. Mm. The question is, where, what happened to all that? Mm. Well, a lot of that is still not been unlocked, has still not been released uh, back really? to Libya. That's right. Um, and it's interesting with the, there's now, well, there's three or four rival governments now in Libya. Uh, so there's the one based in Tripoli, uh, which is the remnants of the parliament that was elected in 2012 that then lost the election um, in 2014. Um, then <clears throat> there's the government set up by the parliament that was elected in 2014, which is based in Tobruk. These two have been at war. Um, there's ISIS as well. And now there's a UN uh, so-called unity government, although it's interesting, the only unity it can really claim is unity of the other two rival governments in opposing it. That's, that's the only real... And, and it's, it's very interesting when this government was announced. The other two existing governments on the ground, actually the presidents of both parliaments, signed a joint letter. This is two warring parliaments, signed a joint letter to the UN saying neither of them recognize its authority. And yet this is being proposed as a, as a unity government. Now this has been established for one reason only, which is to provide a fig leaf of legitimacy for the reoccupation of Libya that's now underway um, with British forces and US forces and so on. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, the Tobruk parliament has been fighting against ISIS, has actually retaken uh, Benghazi in recent months, and has done so despite the fact that it's been fighting, if you like, with its hands tied uh, behind its back. None of these funds have been released to it, uh, and none of um, uh, the, there's still an arms embargo on pla in place. They're not allowed to import any weapons, or the, the, the other so-called Islamist parliament is getting it weapons is, supplied course. by Qatar and so on, Western allies. Uh, so despite this, it's managed to retake Benghazi from ISIS and some of the other uh, associated groups. Um, the other point is, the, you know, the, remember the West set up this group, the Friends of Libya. They said, we're the Friends right. of Libya, right. right? And what they meant is, we're going to destroy the <laughs> Libyan state. Um, and these Friends of Libya, the World Health Organization put out a plea um, this year for 50 million pounds uh, dollars of aid, of which it said it's received less than two million dollars. So this is, these are the friends of Libya. These are the, the, the friends that Syria can expect if the friends of Syria and, and their, their gangs ever come to power. And the health minister uh, in Libya actually said that the budget for this year, uh, for 2016, is zero. 
because none of these um, funds, frozen funds, are being released. So this is, this is the state and this is the devastation that's being wrought on Libya still today by NATO, who's refusing to allow Libyan money to be spent on Libyan people. So as long as this chaos continues, the funds will continue to be held where they are now. No one actually is claiming them. Uh, just Dan, touching on, on the previous point you made about a thousand British troops actually currently stationed, supposedly stationed in Libya. What do you make of that? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Can it make the situation any worse? Yeah, well, um, I'm not sure if there are a thousand currently there. We know there are at least some special forces there at the moment, and there are plans for 6,000 European troops to occupy uh, Libya, of which the British contingent is, is expected to be a thousand. That hasn't happened yet. That's waiting for, um, uh, for the OK from this so-called sham national unity government. Now, the, the, the British government keeps flip-flopping over this excuse for reoccupying Libya. Don't forget, Britain and US have been clamoring to reoccupy Libya ever since their air bases were thrown out. And their air bases were the biggest in, in Africa. In 1970, they were thrown out uh, by Gaddafi, and then they've never been back since. They, they keep flip-flopping over the reasons for this, the pretext. Dan, I have to cut you there. I think a show on immigration actually deserves an, an entire program. Thanks mm. again for being guest. You've Thanks been a much. great one. Coming up next, an uprising that inspired a generation of uprisings against colonial rule. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Sputnik. A hundred years ago, this Easter, a group of Irishmen rose up against oppressive British colonial rule, proclaiming independence of the Irish Republic, triggering what is known today as the Easter Rising. Their movement not only inspired Ireland, but oppressed peoples from across the world. Arbi Benhidi, one of the architects of Algeria's war of independence against France, famously described the uprising as the spark that triggered his ambition to rid his country of its colonial masters. Although the Easter Rising was rapidly stamped down by British forces, independence was only finally achieved six years later. To discuss this in more detail is the man behind the hugely successful Twitter handle Crimes of Britain, Garoid McNamara. Garoid, welcome on board. Thanks for having me. Garoid, just give us a bit of context to the Easter Uprising. You know, what led these six Irish men to actually proclaim the Irish Republic and turn against British rulers. Well, British rule in Ireland was always so fierce and dominant, and if anything, Ireland was used as a laboratory for Britain's colonial escapades around the world. Practiced everything there. The colonial police were formed in Ireland, then sent around the world. The oppression in Ireland at that time, it was, you know, only the second poorest place in Europe after Russia under the Tsar. So the poverty was, was immense. People had nothing. People were oppressed. They were being sent off to fight. In Belgium, you know, in the so-called defence of smaller nations, and uh, obviously for Britain, Ireland wasn't small enough a nation to be defended, if you will. So even Connolly, when he was uh, on his deathbed and court-martialed, mentioned that the British government has no right in Ireland, never will have any right. And he also talks about this uh, situation with sending Irishmen to Belgium to be butchered. Why can't they fight a home for their own nation? So from the proclamation of 1916, um, the Irish Republic, the British forces have always waged war on this entity. Uh, it didn't disappear in 1916, it exists today, and they continue to wage war on it. You know, it was a 32-county Irish Republic that was claimed, not 26, not a three-state. And the British forces that came in in 1916, 16,000 of them crushed it, you know, bombarded the place, artillery. Pierce surrendered to save civilian lives. It was a military surrender, not a political one. One thing that I find fascinating is that although, I mean, Britain pretty much recognises the atrocities committed in Africa, in mm -hmm. India, there's very little talk in the national discourse about what happened in Ireland. You know, why is Irish oppression so absent from the national narrative? First of all, it's so close to home, if you will, for Britain. Uh, it's almost like a fawn in their side, the way they carry on with it. I mean, in the Easter Rising, you had atrocities, the North King Street Massacre, mm -hmm. shooting down innocent civilians. And even, even in recent history, you know, in, in people's lifetime here, they've, they've massacred Irish people on the streets. So I think, first of all, there's um, a very... There's a racist element when it comes, when it comes to uh, Irish people in England. You know, they were the last people to be added to the Race Relations Act. The saying, you know, luck of the Irish mm -hmm. is uh, actually meant the irony that how unlucky they are. It's nothing to do with any, any kind of good luck or good fortune. And uh, John Lennon sung that song, uh, Luck of the Irish, in, 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 the, in the proper context. But I think in Britain, they've, they see Ireland almost still and try and claim it, you know, with the British Isles, which is, they use as a geographical colonial context, to still lay claim to it. And, you know, with the 
events at the weekend, which they call celebrations, but you know, it should be a commemoration. Um, even in Britain, you know, there's like um, they called it an uprising, as you said, not a rising, and negative connotations around it, you know, calling it a rebellion and what have you. But, but that's, that's the British side of it. But what about the Irish itself? You being a young Irish man, how do the Irish people today look back at, at that? Um, well, this year it's been spoken about more than any other time in, in history, arguably, you know. So I think for the youth, um, they're certainly taking an interest. And there's a lot of revisionism going on. That has to be said. There's a lot of revisionism. The Irish Republic is 32 counties. It's not the 26 counties. That, that free state entity is not the Irish Republic and they don't they obviously don't educate people about this. It's very simple, but they dare not mention that the what these pe people died for in nineteen sixteen was not what the situation we have today. And you know, in nineteen sixteen the British didn't leave, in nineteen twenty two they didn't leave, in forty nine no and certainly not in ninety eight you still have a continued occupation in Ireland. A few months ago on your seat sat uh, Senator David Norris. Okay. And he described that the that the proclamation, the revolution, was actually just a replacement of flags. What do you think of that? Well, you know, Connolly did say, you know, just twisting the green flag, they're going to still rule us for our landlords and our capitalists and all this. I think um, I don't agree with, with his position, but um, certainly the island that we have today, there's, there's very little difference from it. It is a British created state, it's not an Irish state, it, is created, it was created by a British king. <laughs> you know, it's not um, what the men died for in 1916, certainly not. Well, coming back to the youth, actually, I'm quite interested in seeing, because obviously Irish society has changed considerably in, in mm -hmm. the past 20 years. I mean, mm -hmm. it recently voted in favour of gay marriage, and this was previously a sort of very conservative Catholic society. Mm -hmm. So you can see that there's been a massive shift in, in culture and thinking. And I'm just curious as to whether, you know, the youth are familiar with the struggle of their ancestors, do they relate to it? And also, are they aware of the influence their ancestors actually had across the globe? I would say they don't. I mm. think even in Ireland today, the elephant in the room is the North. You didn't yep. see it mentioned at all. So when it comes to what happened, you know, they won't know about Chittagong in India, that they'd done a commemoration in April to coincide with it, uprising against the British. And they knew it was going to fail, but they took spirit from the uh, Irish rebellion. You know, Marcus Garvey, um, he was uh, inspired by Ho Chi Minh and even in uh, Egypt. In 1919, you know, it had massive impacts. There was probably more solidarity and links then than there is today. You know, it's almost Ireland sort of at one stage was not really seen as part of Europe, just as a colony, but now it is part of Europe. You know, people there seems they, they almost have become part of Britain in a, in a way that they've accepted British culture. Irish culture is is almost like um, at the weekend, almost. You know, it's like a carnival um, for some people, rather than what it should be about of commemorating and remembering that it's unfinished. Um, you had parading Co Island called Unfinished Revolution because it is, it's, it is unfinished and it's continuing. Well, speaking of unfinished, um, obviously it had, it left, the proclamation of independence left a bitter taste because obviously it's not the whole of Ireland that was liberated or mm -hmm. became independent. What is your take on a completely independent island? Is that feasible or do you think that actually what is known as the six counties of, of Ulster, do they still want to remain under the British crown? Well, in 1918, the Irish people voted for Ireland to be uni unified um, as one. Mm. And the colonial state in the north, uh, which was founded by supremacists, sectarian gerrymandered state. So the mandate for Irish freedom is there from 1916, 1918. That resides still today in the army of the Irish Republic. They've got the authority. It was given to them by the third door. Um, it stands with them. They don't need, in today's society, people to go, we need you here. Pierce and Connolly didn't expect everybody to get involved. They wanted them to pledge their allegiance to the Irish Republic, obviously, but they didn't expect people to get behind it. So there's always a minority that will oppose British rule. The majority in Ireland, you know, they might lend support now and again, but generally, they, they stick with the status quo. And as long as you've got, you know, the unionist veto in the north, I, I mean, it's, it's a very tricky situation. You can't vote in my opinion, on a country's independence, it's beneath its dignity and, mm. what if it got, you know, if, if, if it goes the wrong way, you're reinforcing colonial occupation. It's my experience is that the people uh, in the north are more aware uh, and more, more active in their wish to be unified rather than people in the north. Um, they're yes. complacent to the white elephant, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, they're living under the occupation, you know, mm. it's around them. And there's a lot of 
splits and everything in Ireland, obviously, which is, for our Irish history, people have split. It's part and parcel of it. It's history repeating itself, almost. But, again, as long as you've got almost, you know, people working as British Crown reformers and you're not going to get anywhere because they've been duped. Um, you've gone back to constitutional, you're not even constitutional nationalism, arguably, even beyond that. Um, so republicanism at the moment is in an interesting phase and arguably at its worst point. But you're, you're a young guy and you've obviously mastered social media. What would you do to engage the sort of Irish youth who at the very least should be made aware of their noble history? Certainly. I think, first of all, you know, many people, when you, when you mention the word IRA, it's seen as immediately terrorist. And the men that carried out 1916 were the IRA, unified together as in brotherly unity. You know, the citizen army who were the socialists came together with the Irish volunteers. Um, I think to get the youth engaged, it's, first of all, we have to get back to basics. And people need to understand that the 32 counties is the Irish Republic and the states we're living in now are two illegitimate states that have been created purely to wage war on that Republic and they've waged war on it ever since 1916 and continue to do so. It's, um, it's the British way almost. Well so. you've got 30,000 followers so yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm guessing you get mm -hmm. a big conversation flowing there. Mm -hmm. Yes yeah, certainly I think I put stuff out from all over the world with the Irish stuff it is um, certainly I don't try and revise any history to, to the facts and um, People do retweet and all this kind of carry on and do engage in discussion. But again, people seem to think that because of 26 counties independent in 1922, so they say, they, that that part is done. But really, that, that is a big problem when it comes to reunifying Ireland. And it's not a simple job of just the six joining the 26. You, you've actually got to go with the mandate that what Connolly died for, what Pierce died for, they didn't die for what we have today, certainly. <laughs> Fascinating discussion, Garoy. Thank you very much for being on okay. the show. You've been a great guest. Thanks. So it's that time of the show when we find out what you guys have had to say about the topics discussed today. Gayatri, what's being said on the Twitter sphere? Well, on uh, Easter Rising, centenary of it, Colette says, thank God for the brave men and women who led the way to eventual partial freedom. And Lou Gogan says, the Irish are still oppressed now by Irish politicians who have contempt for the people. Oh, I'm afraid that's the fate of all of us, to be honest. That's Oppressive right. politicians are found yeah, in yeah, every corner. There, actually. <laughs> um, about um, uh, NATO's air forces five years ago, Libya today being a, um, basically a, a basket case. Watching Pakistan says, Libya was the most prosperous nation in Africa. Thanks to Western intervention, it's now Afghanistan 2.0. Well, I'm afraid that's it, really. Every Western intervention in the Middle East or Africa has made a very bad situation worse. We only keep going on that way. And those are all the tweets for today. Sadly, that's the end of the show with me, Hafsa Sakara Mustafa, standing in for George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. But you can stay in touch with us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. Until next week, it's been marvellous. <laughs>